Hello everybody, and welcome to my latest live stream. I guess. I still need to come up with a better thing to say at the start of these. Uh, we have been playing through the Kazo Mythos, and we are now on the third game, Trilby's Notes, which is kind of just regarded by everybody as the best one by a significant margin. So I'm kind of excited for it, and I'm also terrified of the, the many issues I'm sure it will have that I completely forgot about over the years. Uh, this one, I know, that, well, you know the kid in the first game who was chained in the basement and then beaten to death? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna get to see that this time, so I'm gonna say, hey, content warning on that for sure. This one is definitely the goriest, and the grossest, maybe, in, in, a, in a Silent Hill way. And, uh, that's... That's about all I got. It's got music too, which will be nice. We won't be playing this entirely in to the sound of silence outside of finales. I'm just gonna go right into this. Actually, I lied. Before I go into this, I do want to actually link this this old Let's Play of the entire series, which I should also point out. The games have the R slur. Yahtzee's comments in the Let's Play have the R slur, and the guy doing the Let's Play uses descriptions with the R slur. It's of its time, to be sure. But it is a very cool Let's Play just because Yahtzee starts posting in the middle of it, and the archive preserves his commentary, and so there's a lot of sort of him looking back on these games and being like, ah, yeah. Like, that was dumb, that was bad, shouldn't have done that. But, is there a better one? This is the one I'm familiar with. This is the one that I started looking at. Mainly because the next game has an absolutely buckwild scene, and I really wanted to see if I could find Yahtzee's commentary on it, because y you will want it. <laughs> ah, did he? Okay. I never... Followed him enough to know him as more of like general gamer schmutz. But okay, that sucks. Alright, well, Trilby's notes. Let's, uh, I don't think we'll be seeing any of that in here at least. Man, I gotta use the keyboard this time. Tutorial? Wow. No. Commentary. Not today. Following documents are taken from the handwritten notes of Trilby, an STP field operative whose real name remains unknown. That went away a little too quick. Game over. Ah, well. I guess I have to press a button. That was what I thought as I stood and watched the foe manor collapse into flaming ash. The ordeal was over. Those five days cost us all so much. Philip and AJ paid with their lives. They were the fortunate ones. Jim Fowler was expelled from school for truancy. A bright future in tatters. Kid reading Treasure Island and Terry Pratchett. No longer welcome in the British educational system. Simone Taylor took to the bottle. Her broadcast became slurred, her eyes hollow and unwelcoming. She soon vanished from television screens. As for me, I tried to return to life as a cat burglar, but I had been forever tainted by my time spent in that wretched house. Gonna say, this font ain't great on modern displays, like this is still pretty tiny for me. The memories of my possession came back in my nightmares. Every night I was there again, in the mansion, staring out through unfamiliar eyes as Philip died at my hands. I became convinced that John Defoe was not at rest, and that someday he would return for me. I became so terrified of invisible enemies that I forgot about the tangible ones. Trilby caught! Infamous thief. Captured. What's that say? Too slow. Oh, that's a W. Two slow, miserable years after Defoe Manor. A barrage of truncheon blows taught me a harsh lesson in reality, and I woke up in the kind of filthy cell I assumed would be my new home. But then he came, the man from the government, with his nervous smile, offering an alternative. The STP, the Special Talent Project. 
The government loved Trilby so much. It hadn't been that much earlier that I would have sooner died than entered an obligation with anyone, least of all the government. Had Defoe Manor changed me so much? Whatever my reasons, I left my past behind and resolved to give my new superiors nothing to complain about. Spent a year and a half completing assignments, developing contacts, and building a reputation. And then the past caught up. In the summer of 1997, I became concerned about Simone Taylor's mental well-being. The papers were reporting her continual breakdown, and she had become a virtual recluse. I had no idea if my appearance would assist or hinder. I had, after all, deliberately allowed her to think me dead. Presumably she knew differently now, after the media coverage of my arrest, but I would expect her to be bitter about my subterfuge. On balance? On balance. I decided that a meeting with an old friend would most likely be beneficial. I came to an apartment building on a warm, stormy night and braced myself for the encounter. Here we are. Look at me go. That's a, that's a man with a confident walk. It was a warm and stormy night. So, you move up and down extremely slowly, but you really get going horizontally. And, you know, it's using the, the notes motif quite well. What did I do next? I looked. Simone's apartment building was gripped by a thick smell of musty, unwashed carpets. It perplexed me that a celebrity would choose to live in such a low-rent accommodation. Summer Storm. Is this her apartment, or is it the next one? Okay, I'll be... I'll be nice. Do I have an inventory? We got lockpicks, that's good. All right. Door is locked. Knock. Knock sharply upon Simone's door. Knock, knock. Receiving no reply, I knocked again louder. No. Okay. Still no response. The doorman had assured me Simone was in. I decided it was time to enter by my own methods. I don't know what kind of cheap apartments have a doorman. Well, fortunately, we've seen our inventory. Also, how do I save? Do I just type save? Okay. We've also abandoned the day structure. I can't just easily name my save files. Pick. Lock. The reason that Simone could have been in trouble, even if she wasn't, then at worst I was only playing to my reputation. I spent a few minutes feverishly picking the lock, then let myself in. Great. Okay, we're in here somewhere. Bedroom light refused to turn on, stood in pitch darkness. The intermediate flashes of lightning preventing my eyes from adjusting. Given how text heavy this is, I, I'm already thinking we won't actually get through this in one go. I guess there's a window. Open the blinds. Hold open the blind. Alright. Ah. See, this is good. This is cool. Sorry that she died, like, two minutes into this game. But, good... Good presentation. The body on the floor was undoubtedly Simone. I felt for a pulse, and my hands came away stained with long, cooled blood. Fingers traced the outline of a large wound in her torso, slashed by a big weapon wielded by a big assailant. I called for an ambulance, as futile as it would be, and left before they arrived. Due to me being a clear murder suspect, I was relieved from duty for the week, at the week it took for the Ministry of Occultism to inspect the flat and confirm supernatural activity. Blech. My superiors simultaneously apologized and assigned me to investigate if there was a connection to the Defoe Manor incident. Yeah, you know, the British Ministry of Occultism. What's it called? Torchlight. I think it's called Torchlight. What was that spin-off series? That not Doctor Who. Torch something. Is it Torchlight? Because Torchlight's that action RPG also. Torchwood, yeah, okay. 
Wrong torch. Merely reading those three words capitalized on the front of the loose leaf file brought the nightmares back with more intensity than ever. Sure enough, a field agent reported that looters had discovered and sold several artifacts from the mansion, including the wooden idol that housed John Defoe's soul. To my surprise, no murders had been reported or committed by anyone who had come into contact with the accursed trinket. I did not find this reassuring. I quickly advised James Fowler to go into hiding. He was stunned, but agreed. The boy had sense, and still reflected respected my judgment. This done, I began following the idol's trail from the pawn shop it had entered the possession of one Professor Abed Chalhal, an authoritative historian. He had scheduled some kind of antique fair at the Clan Brownin Hotel on a small island off the coast of Anglesey, popular with tourists. The font ain't helping here. Assuming the role of a scholar of antiquities, I booked a room. On the 28th of July, 1997, I caught a ferry from... Or... Th those are L's? They look kind of like T's. From that place, and arrived at 3 p.m. in Clan Brown's Island's coastal village. It's easier to read when, like, it's full screen. This is, like... This is Adventure Game Studio, which apparently caps you at like 320 by 200, and it lets you run it at double resolution, which is still very tiny today. Can I do this? I'll scroll the window on my screen down, so it's more at eye level here. It seemed a peaceful hamlet, and in defiance of stereotypes, the locals were welcoming, and told me no local legends to dissuade me from exploring the island. Um... This is an awful hotel name to say out loud. So I always want to just say, like, Clan Brown win. The hotel was in the island center, surrounded by forest. I made my way there on foot. This is a horrible place to have an antiques fair, then. Here we are. Your trilby, right? As soon as I arrived, I was greeted by a balding man in a gray anorak. I wondered if, it was, if I was expected to know who he was. That depends. My name is Linkman. I'm with Ministry of Occultism. Oh. I thought the Ministry were clear on the fact that I was handling this on my own. Maybe there are still people who don't trust you, Mr. Trilby. What? I haven't stolen anything since I joined the STV. Your colorful past is not what concerns my superiors. It hasn't gone unnoticed that your history with the Defoe Wraith influences you psychologically. I'm sure you resist it, but it could still cause you to act irrationally, disobey orders. Everyone just feels a little safer with someone else on the ground. I see. You can rest assured that I will endeavor to maintain absolute professionalism on this assignment. Don't you see my hat? Nevertheless, I have my orders. I would suggest we keep out of each other's way, then, and pursue separate investigations. Let's split up. I'm sure I don't want to get mixed up in a reunion. Watched him disappear around the corner of the building. I very much doubted that Linkman and I would become friends. The hotel lobby was a warm welcome. The building was certainly well maintained, and yet there was something about it that nagged at the back of my mind, quickening my pulse. I dismissed the sensation, an act which in retrospect I would come to regret. Terence Railby, everybody! That's our alias, it's very clever. Alright, room 3C on the third floor, and he's gotta sign the check-in book. Oh. Hello, Bethan. Just letting you know I'll be having dinner in my room today. That's absolutely fine, Professor. Then, this, I decided, was what they called a golden opportunity. Professor Jahal? Yes? I'm afraid you have me at a disadvantage. Railby. Terence Railby. We met at Sotheby's a few months ago. Uh, oh. 
You don't remember me. No, no, of course I do. Harry Railby, how have you been? The astute reader had already guessed that both Terence Railby and the previous meeting were utter fiction. I have spent some time studying Chahal's movements and habits. He was, by all accounts, absent-minded, and that was something I could use. Okay, cool items for sale. Okay, we're a freelance scouter for some wealthy collectors. And a guy, dude, who's totally interested in Defoe Manor. In Buckinshire. Thank you for the bits, then. And also, I think it was before I actually started, started. TGH. Alright, we're just gonna lie. Lie our way to success, as always. All right, now it's a now it's a convention. Hang out with this dude. Lead the way, professor. Who's your friend? It's my personal assistant, Chauvin. She accompanies me on most of my excursions. Yvonne, this is Mr. Railby, an old acquaintance. He's looking for information on the Poe Manor artifacts. Oh, really? Him and half the people we meet? What is it about that place? Never underestimate the attraction of a mystery. Alright, are we in control? No, we're still locked. Know any good ghost stories? No. Okay. Shouting on behalf of the client is a great way to not be interested while still being interested. I don't know how old we are, but I feel like it's not wild for a man Trilby's age to... I mean, that's, that's correct. That's an old man look for sure. O'Malley. Wouldn't it be more Irish if I tried? Right. Well, now free of the... of the limited dialogue conversations, so we can talk about whatever we want. Talk about... Bow Manor? I don't know. Okay. Professor. Okay, I think there's a... Yeah, okay, F3 brings up the, the previous text. I think that's the same as in Hugo's House of Horrors. Is that just convention? That's, not, that's probably like a Sierra thing. About antiques. Spell that wrong. Oh my god, I'm struggling here. Talk to Professor about the manor. There we go. Something works. All right, everybody's surprised that, you know, all these cool wooden items survived a house fire. All about the incident. Experiencing a sick feeling they have not felt for quite some time. The last I felt it was while standing at the gates of another country mansion, not long after Defoe Manor, preparing to break in. Following those five wretched days churned my stomach with fear, turning what had once been the joy of thievery into an exercise in anxiety. Discussing it brought back the feeling of feigning ignorance. White visions of welding masks and machetes flooded my mind's eye, worsened them. I heard something on the news. Well, it's it's a very special wood, is the thing. And that's what this game is going to be all about. Silly talk about the paranormal. It's very difficult to, to find the facts. The point is, some enterprising fellows picked up one or two undamaged items from the ruins. Furniture, books, ugly little figurine. 
All right, what kind of books you got? The books, though, I, I got nothing on. <laughs> I don't know why the books survive the fire. Talk about books. Oh my god. Talk to professor about books. Okay, fine. Be idle. Tell me, does a huge man in a welding mask and leather apron mean anything to you? Very sneaky, Trilby. Never mind. Okay, we're looking into the figurine. Lots of... Lots of shaming. Virtually valueless. Don't worry. My client's a weirdo. He wants all the stuff that you consider garbage. He loves the paranormal. Alright, open and shut case. We're just gonna... Hand the man some cash. Grab the trinket and get out of here. Inwardly, I just want to get this mission completed as fast as possible. I didn't want to risk suspicion or giving off the wrong impression. That'll be fine. So now we just get to, you know, five days in the antiques fair. Lots of hands, silverware, ceramics, a burnt rocking chair, and the painting, of course. Landscape from the wall in the man mansion's lounge. Of little artistic value, but the artist features prominently in the Poe Manor's colorful history. I don't think I ever actually looked at that painting when I was playing Five Days, but yeah, Matt Defoe did his little landscape. That was the one painting his dad like didn't hate him for doing instead of being a military guy. Well, and it was even there in the lobby, and I didn't notice. Oh. I see why they sent another person here. He's, he's struggling a bit already. Oh. Well. Seen a ghost. You didn't see it? See what, Mr. Railby? I'm sorry, I... I have to go. Something's wrong. Oh, well, we won't keep you then. We'll see you later, maybe? My head was spinning, and a sudden nausea churned in my gut. The world seemed to be pulsating, the corners of the room wavering like a heat haze. The body is here, the soul is not. You may say I imagined these things, and I thought that must have been the case. Was I going out of my mind? Was the hotel really changing into some nightmarish twin? Was I the only one who could see it? If I was hallucinating, it was too complex. The harsh wooden floor beneath my feet felt real enough. The horrendous stench of rotting flesh that reached my nostrils could not have been conjured by my imagination. I decided I had to find John Defoe's idol as soon as possible. If not that, then at least the painting Jaha had mentioned. I was convinced that some connection lay between Defoe Manor and the sudden madness. So from from looking at earlier parts of that Let's Play, I didn't I specifically did not read the Trilby's Notes parts. I read five days and seven days and that, but Yahtzee does say like he did he got he got Silent Hill and Eternal Darkness around the time he started making this. He's not not afraid to admit it. It's kind of, yeah, blatant, but it works. I hadn't played Silent Hill or Eternal Darkness, so to me, this was cool as heck. What's the outside doing? Panes were cracked in bloodstains and wooden boards blocked the view. Apparently nailed haphazardly on from outside. I don't think we can just go anywhere. Yeah. Also, we got this... Oh yeah, see, there we go. Now we can... We got our first Chizo. Blood was everywhere. North Wall of used to spell a word which I could read, neither recognize nor pronounce. The good spooky sounds in the background are nice. 
The bed is now a stone altar, chains and manacles for sacrificial purposes. Anything cool on the table. Oh, a severed head, that's what that is. The big issue with this one is the number of times I am going to be typing open door. Also, I was complaining about moving vertically. Welcome to the stairwell. Run. Can you move down? No, I didn't think so. But it's worth checking, because nobody knew you could do that in Hugo. Hmm. Body of a young muscular man, I hazard, and was wearing some kind of old fashioned military uniform, complete with blue tunic and riding boots. More to the point, his head was missing, missing and his hands were worn down to bloody wads of flesh and bone. And then I pressed a button and lost the rest of the description. Handwritten pages on the floor. Okay, that tracks. Get papers. Entries from a diary. Let's get some files. July 18th. Felicia and I took shelter from the storm in a decrepit old hotel in the forest. It seems to be completely deserted, so we bedded down the floor in the lobby for the night. It is so peaceful here. The noise of the storm seems far away. July 19th. Following the hotel has become increasingly clear that this place is not as innocent as it first seemed. We found ancient corpses and evidence of terrible deeds in several of the rooms. The storm has cleared, and we intend to leave as soon as possible. July 20th. I am certain now that devilry is at work. Every path we take through the forest brings us back to the hotel. We spent a whole day trying routes to no avail. Felicia keeps talking of a demon she fancies she saw in the hotel kitchen last night. July 21st. Felicia is dead. I was too late to help her. I saw her murderer just as she did. Perhaps I will be next. I am beginning to understand. 23rd. This murderous figure in black, the one whose body is savagely stretched out into a mockery of form, is not the architect of this nightmare. Rather, this is the work of that hideous lord of the Forbidden Lands. Gods forgive me. I built a shrine to my captor in the lobby in an attempt to appease it. Nothing has changed. I have no more food. The horror is starting to affect my mind. I'm certain my mind is going. I imagined for a moment the hotel, the hotel had changed had become finely decorated and welcoming as it must have been in the past. I blinked and it returned to its normal, hateful self. Next few pages are sprinkled with blood. What is his relationship to that disgusting beast? Is he a servant or a prisoner? Sometimes he acts alone. Sometimes he... Something... So, oh, sometimes at the behest of a higher power. What does he want from me? He is after me now. I think I must have done something wrong. He hurts. It's the last readable entry. I decided not to take them with me. They were covered in blood and all stuck together. Spooky stuff. The lobby too had been tainted, and the painting I saw it was absent. Presumably it only existed in the hotel's normal form. Well, he really figures... He's, he's got this normal dark world thing down already. I guess that's why he's in the special talent project. Alright, we need to find a way back to the hotel or to dispel the hallucination if this truly was all in my mind. This stage, I was beginning to wonder if this really was all John Defoe's doing. It didn't seem his style somehow. But what other evil could possibly be the culprit? How you doing, buddy? Someone had been tied down to the altar, flayed, and had their innards removed. By the looks of the horrible claw marks and broken fingernails, they had been alive at least partway into the procedure. Check out the pentagram. Pentagram, house skull. Oh, was that your offering? That's the shrine you made? You just drew a pentagram and slapped a cow skull on it? That, that's probably not going to do it, huh?
Ooh. Well, that's fun. Don't don't accidentally minimize. Still open door? No. I love that this uh the tall man, as he's known for most of this game, just has his own little painting here. Left poster was some kind of portrait of the strange masked figure I had glimpsed in the hotel. The middle poster was blank, the third was smashed. Do we have centipede? Okay, the arcade machine is damaged. Not very helpful. Anything I should be picking up? I've got a lock through open, but... I feel like this one is a bit better designed. Ah, here we go. Here's an item. The meat. Uncooked meat with ribs sticking out at the center table that seemed to be attracting insects beautifully. I tried not to think about what kind of meat it was, but I did take it. Uh, sorry, some of it. A lump of meat. If I come up against anything hostile and carnivorous in this place, I'll throw rotten meat at it. The bathrooms appear to be closed. Four doors and unseen inviting. East back to the hallway, west to the kitchen. Some kind of unisex bathroom and another large one that someone had boarded up. Some kind of flayed corpse was nailed into the place over the door of the toilet, blocking the way. Okay. We're not getting through the nailed up one, that's for sure. Actually. All right, fingers crossed. What did Yahtzee do if you just type fuck? I don't know why I hit an S there. Just one is plenty. Oh, okay. Nothing fun? I'm really surprised. All right, this hotel sucks. That wasn't what I wanted to. Hugo lets me type in advance as I approach these doors. The Clabony Hell, everybody. Exterior is corrupted as the interior. Ground beneath my feet was hard, red, and gritty, like desiccated clay. Mm. Right. Beer. Head. There we go. Two heads on the right were decayed down to their skulls, but the one on the left was very much fresh. Its features made unfamiliar by the torment it had undergone. I don't think there's really much of anything out here. Yeah. So, you know, thanks to the Dark World, we're still trapped. Once again. First in a mansion, then in space, and now just we got a hotel a little bit outside. Oh, you don't need to. Okay. Okay. Should I go upstairs? Oh, okay. Yeah, once again, the walkthrough is just gonna save me from backtracking. It does diminish the atmosphere a bit if you're just doing this, if you're just looking at the guy, though. This one? Okay. Yeah, you gotta really use your eyes here. You know, those like eight pixels, they're bright in color and it's colorful. They stand out kind of, I guess. Flyers. Okay. Okay, Trilby. Three flyers.
There we go. We'll just take these nails out. This guy. And now we can go to the bathroom. How's the mirror? Pretty bad. We're not allowed to... This one's bloody. Is that a special toilet? Nope. I do at least like that you don't have to look toilet three times. It is just... If it's fluff, it's just willing to say, hey, this is what the toilets look like. Looks like there is something here on the counter. Two sinks. And a brand new sealed envelope. Wash baits. Okay, don't use the sink. Fine, fine. Open the letter. Spelled open wrong. Baffled, I took the envelope. It was strangely bulky and tore it open. A white pill bottle and a note fell out into my hand. I here enclose the note with this report. Trilby, if you're reading this, then you too have seen the hotel change. At present, I have no idea if the alternative hotel is part of the ethereal realm or some kind of construct, a pocket dimension. There is a definite correlation between one's level of agitation and one's tendency to reality shift. Fear is your enemy. It leaves you shining like a beacon for whatever evil brought us to this place. Enclosed is a bottle of tranquilizers from my personal first aid kit. When you find yourself shifting into the other place, take a pill and try to calm down, and the real hotel will return. Do not let it concern you. I'm researching this phenomenon. Your task is to find a foe. Good luck, Agent Linkman. Hmm, well... Thank you for the pills, I guess. Okay, tab just pops open the inventory. Lockpicks, pills, and a lump of meat. Let's take a pill. Let's take a chill pill. Bang. This part is not fun enough. Hesitantly, I tipped a tranquilizer into my palm and swallowed it without water. Uh, so you, you do have an infinite quantity of them. There is a puzzle later on where, like, they stop working. And you have to find something else, but, like, you're, you're cool. You just got all the pills you need. Trilby is probably going to have a lot of tranquilizers today. Quickly took effect. I felt the anxiety lift from the pit of my stomach, and my dismal surroundings seemed to feel less imposing. Then I felt that strange sensation again of lightheadedness and detachment as the world around me began to quiver. Hey, look at that. Now we can use the toilet. Mm, I guess not. How's this mirror? It's still broken. Wash my hands of grime, splash cold water into my face, and then dry myself quickly. It's, it's a nice bathroom. Although... I don't... I honestly don't know how I've ever seen a, a unisex bathroom with, like, stalls, as opposed to just one toilet. Okay, we're here now. That's true. Let's see. Oh, we're back. I was throwing my hands in the air for too long. All right. The hotel is one step above a bed and breakfast. Can I enter the light world kitchen? No. It's very mysterious. So the game really likes to do the link to the past thing and make good use of the light and dark world shifting and that's gonna be important we can see what this room is that we couldn't get to before never mind it's locked by a deadbolt on the other side that's interesting there we go stock of cola
Vintage advertisements. All right, the arcade is broken. A pub quiz. Oh, never mind. I don't care for that. Out of order. The bar looks nice. Other than, like, the horror, this seems like a a nice small little place to stay for a few days. Ah, right. Oh, we're out of Silent Hill, but whatever. Is it just... I think it's... Does he say anything? Oh, well, I guess we're back here again. Centipede is good. Is just it shouldn't be the only game in space. Hey, I don't want to be in the dark world if you can believe that. We're just gonna have another pill. But yeah, the the outside also loops. I just don't think there's any real justification for it other than like, hey, we kind of need to keep you here. Here's the painting. I was frankly astonished that Matthew Defoe's painting had survived the immolation of Defoe Manor. As I stared at it, it seemed that the surrounding room began to blur until only the painting was in focus. I fancied I could hear the creaks and whispers of Defoe Manor's hallways. I felt a bizarre urge to reach out and touch the painting. Ah, ooh. Alright, let's Mario 64 this. Oh. Okay. As I stepped closer, I could feel sound becoming muffled and my head spinning as if I were about to faint. My hands, as if pulled by an invisible string, reached out towards the clumsy brush strokes. So yeah, this is where the uh, the content warning at the beginning. This is where we're going to see the young Matthew Defoe's unfortunate demise. Defoe Manor, July 28th, 1821. Matthew Defoe is 15 years old today. He is excitedly putting the finishing touches to a painting which his father commented on encouragingly, the first time he has ever been supportive of Matthew's artistic leanings. Matthew is now convinced that his father is lifting from the mysterious depression that has plagued him for as long as either of them can remember. Now he intends to make the painting absolutely perfect before showing it again. Knock knock. Master Matthew? Sir Roderick has requested your presence in the trophy room. Thank you, James. And if you would be so good to inform him that I will now be retiring for the night? Very good, James. Ah, there you are, boy. Let me introduce my son, Matthew. Hello. This is my friend, Mr. Smith. He's an expert on African tribal art. Well, just a scholar. Hardly even that. Just someone with an interest in the subject. And he has offered to assess the figurine I brought back from my travels. I wasn't aware you had a family, Sir Roderick. Is your wife home too? Regrettably, Belinda is no longer with me. Oh, I'm sorry. Quite all right, you couldn't have known. She succumbed to illness shortly after Matthew was born. I finished the painting I showed you, Father. Oh, good. Well, Mr. Smith, what do you think of the piece? It's an intriguing little puzzler, actually. The design is reminiscent of a few Central African tribal gods I am aware of. But to be honest, I've never seen anything like this before. May I ask how you acquired it? I'm glad you asked. Twenty years ago, when I was a younger man on my first travels in the Dark Continent. We were traveling along the west coast when our bear spotted a ship that had run aground. It was an English clipper named the Sea Angel and a short exploration revealed that every single crewman had just disappeared. 
as the original Oberdin. Of course, we immediately sent a letter to the nearest embassy to report the finding. But the point is, it was on the lowest deck of the ship that I found this very figurine you see before you today. What an extraordinary tale. But how do you account for there being an African tribal carving on a British vessel? We were as confused as you are. It wasn't a slave trading vessel, but there must have. Well, that's some old timey words. It's been a personal mystery of mine ever since. I was hoping you could help shed a little light on the matter. There is more to tell. I haven't even begun to recount the strange events that have surrounded this artifact. Would you care for a glass of brandy? Let's get some brandy! Alright, into the kitchen. Let's see, can we get that? Oh, the fridge isn't there, because it's old-timey. Oh. Also, the basement is kind of open. I did another painting today. I showed it to Father, and he said it was promising. I keep trying to tell him about you. But he never listens. You haven't knocked for me in so long, I was beginning to wonder. Bang, bang. Hey, do you want to see my painting? I'm just not sure how I'd get it through the door. I gotta say, if you're planning to keep somebody a prisoner in your basement, you probably don't want that basement dungeon to be, like, next to your kitchen. How has he gotten away with this for, like, 15 years? There's another dude in the- he has a butler. How could I truly have possibly known what Matthew was carrying that day? Okay, okay, calm down. Well, he won't be, is the thing. Not in this one. He's... He's just... One of many incidents. That's not now. Get the world famous apron. Oh, I guess... Okay, well, I thought we had to slide it under the door with the apron. Slide painting under door. We'll just, we'll just do it raw. Just give it back when you're finished. How dare you, sir? You intrude on my hospitality and insult my judgment? That's father. Get out of my house, you worm! I better see what's the matter. There's a lot of things that suck about this family. And for this family. Oh, it's you. Father, what happened? I heard shouting. That old fool told me some rubbish about my figurine. I said the only tribe it could have come from all died in slavery years ago. I actually had the nerve to accuse me of buying from a forger. I'm sorry, Father. What are you apologizing for? Where's that damn brandy? I've got it here. Give it to me. I'll, I'll go back to my room, Father. Show me your painting. You said you had a painting. Show it to me. I, I can't, Father. And why not? Because, because... Come on, why not? Out with it. Because I gave it to the boy behind the door. I see. Father, go back to your room, boy. I have to write my diary entry. Yes, father. An hour of silence passed, and Matthew grew concerned about his father. Strangely, the most disturbing thing had been Sir Roderick's reaction to Matthew mentioning the boy behind the door. In the past, raising this had usually provoked a violent rage or an instant flat denial. Matthew wondered what sort of anxiety was going through his father's mind. Smash. What was that? Father, what are you doing?
doors open. Matthew was confused by his own reluctance. He had longed to see what was beyond the store his entire life, but now given the chance, he was struck with fear. He peered cautiously through and saw a set of rough stone steps leading down to some kind of basement. Yeah. Hey, we've heard these words before. Father, what are you doing? Father, no! Father! Ooh! My apologies, dear boy, I couldn't resist. You look so lost in that painting, I don't think you even saw me come in. I, I, what? Is everything all right, Terry? Y yes, everything's fine. It's just, just for a moment there, I thought I saw... Never mind. Siobhan and I were talking about you after you ran out of the room. You said you seemed like something was making you terribly anxious. Frankly, I think that's still the case. I'm okay. Really, I am. Well, if you're sure... I had seen the events that had created John Defoe. I saw his death at the hands of Sir Roderick, that terrible, violent end that would bring him back as that awful wraith. <clears throat> but somehow, seeing that event, it was clear to me that there was more to this than the ghost of this kid. A name stood out in my memory, the Sea Angel, the name of the ship on which Sir Roderick had found the figurine. I now had a lead. Professor, do you know anything about a ship called the Sea Angel? You know, it's funny you should mention that name. There's a really old wooden chisel among the Defoe Manor artifacts, and the words Sea Angel are carved into the handle. Where is this chisel? Out on display in the convention hall, next to the dining room. What's all this about, Terry? It's nothing. It's just... A little side project my clients want me to get on to. Thank you for your help. Sure it's fortunate that this dude's got all the goods. And there's something in the painting now. Get me paper. Oh, this parser just does not allow fun. It was a page from a religious book I wasn't familiar with. I hear and close it with these notes. Victim 5. The Child The fifth man who desired judgment was the child, whose father held the carving of the slave. The prince came to him and was at once rightly pleased with what he found, for the house of the child and his father already knew well the name of the king. And as the prince watched, the child was thrown down by his father and broken with the wood of the prince's soul. But as the child's body, mind, and soul began to drift apart, the prince held them together. And he said, You are the child, and to you I grant power. For I see in you the potential that will grant my father, the king, his greatest wish. You shall not be of the land of technology, nor the realm of magic, but of both. And thus you shall form the bridge. And across the bridge the king shall come to bring his message to the men of technology. Through you, child, the bridge will come. And thus I name you the bridge keeper. And the prince touched the child, and he was the bridge keeper. And his three aspects were granted power, so that his soul would join with the prince's soul in the wood of the tree. And the bridge keeper rose up and threw down his father and threw down his brother, and truly did they know the name of the king. And into the house of his father went the body and the mind of the bridge keeper. That's fun. Let's go see Angel. I think we can go in here now, I hope. Now that's no longer dead bolted from the other side. Nope, okay. 
I know that's where it is. Uh, all right, you know you know the rules. Before you climb all those stairs. Oh, I'm missing the essentials here. Look, there's just like the scissors in the first game, except now there's a reason for somebody to leave stuff lying around, because this is just a normal-ass hotel. Matches. Match. One match. What? Please navigate. You have to go around all the stairs too, you can't go behind them. Does AGS just not allow that? I guess there really hasn't been much in terms of like complex layering in these games. Okay, you know what? For the the reasonable praise so far, this seems stupid for Trilby to just do. Light match. Let's... We just, you know, tried to set off a... F well, I guess we did, it just didn't make a shrill noise or anything. We just lit a fire. A match by a fire alarm to open the fire exit. I don't... We've got no justification for this, honestly. It clicked the door. Like, it worked out in our favor. I can't give you a reason why Trilby did this. Welcome to the backyard. Dark backyard. Sort of altar again. All kinds of blasphemous rituals, I swear. An odd occult symbol is char carved into the surface. Four equilateral triangles arranged into a star, each contained within a single large circle. So that dude's pentagram was just really bad. He, he had like the wrong cult. It's... Oh, pills. See? I hate the, the L's and the T's. What do I do out here? Shelter. No grass or plant life. Hmm. It couldn't be that long, really. It's long enough for a flashback. I guess it, nobody's smelling it, which is good. walkthrough is telling me there should be an item here. Yard, look table. It says look crowbar, but there's very clearly not a crowbar anywhere here. Is it? No? This seems incorrect. How do I get out of here, even? Can I jump this? I don't know if I spell it wrong. Oh. 
so the way the dark world stuff works it kind of changes a bit throughout the game, and I was thinking of how it is later. Later on, it won't take effect immediately when you take a pill, but when you, like, change rooms. So the idea of taking a pill there didn't seem correct. Alright, well now there's a crowbar. You know. In the hotel backyard, as, as there would be. My brain is just refusing to do anything other than open doors. That's right. This is very ZZT. Okay, so now we actually want to reality shift. So hopefully we will show up in the dark world soon enough. And that's also just like a random thing. If you ever want to force a change, you just kind of hang out at a door. There we go. If you're nervous, you're pacing, I guess. What? My name is... Weird. Kind of a lot pickier than I remember. I don't remember, like, ever having issues with the parser. And it was... then like, reading the... That Let's Play I talked about at the beginning, like, Yahtzee specifically said, like, it was very important to me to get synonyms, so every time I get a synonym wrong, or any time this parser acts up, I'm kind of extra annoyed, because he, he was explicitly saying he was prioritizing it. Anywho, the crowbar sucks and broke once we used it once, though, yes, it's easy tea game, for sure. Open door. There we go. Look. Oh my god. So now this room probably hadn't been ventured in for years. Desiccated corpses dangled from the ceiling, left to rot by some warped interior decorator. You don't understand the word garbage. Is it look trash bag? Look bag? That's a, that's a parser failure, I am a... Get sack. Nope. No. Trilby just... Trilby values everything too much. Symbol? Mm-hmm. Alright, so nothing cool here. But now I think we're in, in chill pill territory. So now this is the, the trick. This is how we get to the other side of the deadbolt in the real world. I don't know how anybody else does this. But here we are. We're in the manor. Or the manor. We're in the... In the display room. What do we got here? Mercer's Hall's antique show is as sparse as a small venue would indicate. A couple of tables were laid out with various trinkets, and a charred rocking chair was the centerpiece. Classic rocking chair. What do you mean? You just called it a rocking chair. An involuntary shudder went through me as recognition dawned. It was the same chair from the living room in Defoe Manor, the room I had opted to sleep in for those five days. Spooky. Sign or something on the ground? An ancient shingle from an establishment called the Unicorn. Any cool paintings? Are these hotel paintings? Ah, they're just the hotel and scenery. What about this delicious soda? A bottle of Speedy Cola. Highly caffeinated soft drink. Bottle almost full. Someone must have decided it was beyond the limits of their constitution. That's exactly what I say when I can't finish the soda. It's beyond the limits of my constitution. 
steal this half-finished bottle of soda. It's mine now. What we got? We got some books. Not actually that important. Got some pools. Which, you know, we got the chisel. The sea angel chisel. Again, I found myself inexplicably drawn to the artifact. My fingertips were already sending towards it as if drawn by a magnet. We got a picture. No. Oh. Nah, yeah, I don't think we can really get much of anything for these. Hope we look out the window. Boring yard, you got it. Alright. Touch ye chisel. A loud buzzing played in my ears, and my vision began to cloud as I reached over and laid my hand upon the tool. Somewhere in the Atlantic, July 25th, 1789. What's this guy's name? About to have been a great warrior in battle, his skill was to unmatch in all of Africa. Yeah, okay, we're just gonna roll straight into some stereotypes here. Anywho, the white man came. He was being sold as a slave, along with a whole bunch of other folks, but he got sick, so they threw him overboard and left him to die. But the end did not come then. Coming around, Captain. Voices unfamiliar, speaking an unfamiliar language. Avota was suddenly terrified that the slavers must have returned, but he was as weak as a newborn and could not move or speak. Looks like they picked him up just in time. Don't know how long he's been drifting out here, but he can't have lasted much longer. Good lord. Look upon it, men, the greatest evidence we have of humanity's inherent evil. Never forget, men. Never forget that men, sailors such as you or I, did this. Left this poor wretch to die. Slavers aren't sailors like you or I, Captain. No. I do not know how those devils can have the audacity to still call themselves human. Today, there is no pride in being an Englishman. Find our new passenger some quarters. Make him comfortable. Passenger, Captain? Every innocent who sets foot on my ship is a free man. There's something about this policy you find questionable? Not at all, Captain. No, these were not the slavers. The ship was different, less crowded with terrified faces. There was anger in the voices of the white men, but not directed at Mabota. Still frightened, but somewhat reassured, Mabota passed out. Days pass, health restored. We've been rescued by the ship of these good white men had been a fantastic stroke of good fortune. Thank you, white saviors. He decided that it had been the will of the gods that he should survive, and that proper thanks would be in order. Yeah, so we're going to carve an idol. We just need, you know... Some stuff. And we can't actually talk with them. Barrels. Whoa. A little jolly bolt. Jolly Boat was here, apparently undergoing some repairs. What about this guy? Okay. Well. This dude's got a chill. All right, there, laddie. Oh, I see. You want something to carve with? I'm glad. I'm glad this guy gets it immediately. Nice. Just bring it back when you're finished, just like the painting. People are always saying this. Can we look at the moon? No, <laughs> we do not understand the moon. Large crate was sitting in the shaft of light with letters stenciled on that. Bauta did not recognize. It was cheaply made with poor quality nails, and some of the boards looked ready to fall off. Get some wood. 
I guess so. Oh, well, I guess we got wood and we got a chisel. Well, that counts. Part of an idol? Yeah. The chisel in the wood of the crate, Mabauta could finally create his offering. After several hours, Mabauta was very pleased with the result. A fine rendition of his kingdom's god of fertility and good fortune. All that remained now was to return the chisel. That should be easy enough. Ah. It hurts. Silicos. The vision faded, and I felt myself being hurt hurled forcefully back into the present day. That tall, thin creature. The original Slender Man. Basically. That black-clad ghoul. What was its significance to my predicament? Why did it appear again and again throughout history to spread death and horror? There was no connection to the idol shape or his tribal deities. The tall man was no fertility god. That's what they all say. It must have been connected to the wood of that crate somehow. There had been a name on that crate. About to hadn't been able to read it, but I, looking through his eyes, had. O'Malley Shipping. Could the owner have been an ancestor of Chauvin? It was a flimsy possibility, but at that point, my only lead. I resolved to discuss this with her at the earliest opportunity. And hey, another letter. Who could be dropping these letters for us? Really? You're like two pixels away. I have to. Kirby is standing on it. Probably a bit of that. Honestly, I don't think he was too interested in, like, cleaning up the themes as much of retconning as he did. Victim 4 The Slave. The fourth man who desired judgment was the slave, who had not been brought Freehorn's message, and who tormented the wood that was the prince's soul with a sharpened blade. The prince came to him, and he struck the slave down, and he knew the name of the king. And the prince said, Not one of your households shall I leave alive, slave, for thrice now I have brought my warning, and any who still fail to heed shall be named as fool and judged most unworthy in our sight. Ah, my buddy. Nobody else is at this hotel. This antique convention is pretty miserable. Talk to the professor. Ah, uh, no fun allowed. About O'Malley. Where's Sylvan? She said she was going to get a drink. I keep telling her it's not right for a girl her age to drink so much. But what do I know about young people today? Alright, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Actually, can I talk to him about the chisel? Anything about her family tree? Specifically, whether or not they ran a shipping company in the late 18th century. What on earth makes you think I would know that? I really don't know. I just thought I'd ask. How'd you ask Sobon? Instead of wasting my time and yours with questions she could easily answer herself. Yeah, you know. She's bound to know all about what her family was up to in the 18th century. I know I sure am. Okay, the hotel staff is kind of MIA, and I guess so is everybody else. So maybe we are in a five days of stranger situation. We don't even realize it. I'll get right to the point. How do you spell this? About shipping? I guess that works. Do you anything about the history of your family? I don't want to be much of a... Okay, she's a history student. She's allowed to. 
this. You did it. You justified this successfully. Yep, she's even doing that. Okay. This is a weird question, but hey. Man in a fedora walks up to you in a bar. Did your family run a shipping company in the late 18th century? That is an odd question. But I do remember reading something about O'Malley shipping. I'd have to check my notes. I left them in my book bag. Did you meet me in my room about five minutes? I'm in 2A, next to a bed. Well, yeah, I mean... Generally, when you're in a hotel room, you're next to a bed. Thank you, everybody. All right, now we get to roll the dice. No reality shift. No reality shift. Come on. Yeah. Wait, wrong floor. Ah. That's okay. She said it was 2A. Yep. All right. You have the papers. Trilby is strictly business, which is the appropriate thing to do. You should have sat on the couch, Trilby. I have these moments of illness. What do you want to talk about? Defoe Manor. Oh. Kind of interests me. I was really into the media coverage of the incident at the time. That client of yours, the one who wants the figurine, what does he know about it? Well, he has an interest in the occult, and there's some nonsense story going around about it. Something about the idol being a vessel for an evil ghost. I wasn't really paying attention. Really? I don't remember hearing about that in any of the reports. No, you wouldn't have. It wasn't widely... Have you heard the story that Trilby was in the house? I could feel cold sweat. Ruling. I don't think that word means what you think it means. But wow, you managed to make sweat, like, extra disgusting. Good job. Cold sweat drooling down my spine. Every fiber of my being was concentrating on not giving any outward signs of alarm. Siobhan spoke of my secret name with a wide-eyed enthusiasm. No one believes it, but Simone Taylor insisted it was true right up until, well, you know. He says he saved her from the house. I think... I think that's a little far-fetched. That's exactly what Abed says. He says a ghost is one thing, but throwing Trilby into it just makes it seem silly. Truth be told... I don't think Abed believes in Trilby any more than he does ghosts. He's so grounded in reality. A sensible attitude. Have you... have you always been an antique dealer? Yvonne, please, I came here to talk about... Let me put that another way. Have you ever been an antique dealer? I knew it. The outfit, the hat, Terry Railby... You're him. You were in Defoe Manor. And now you've come here to finish off the ghost. Tavon, I always knew there was something else in this world, that there was something better, more glamorous, just below the surface. Will you take me with you? Listen to me. There is nothing glamorous about what I do. I live in shadows that threaten to consume me every single day. If you pursue this any further, you're going to walk straight into one. What? What are you talking about? There's something extremely dangerous in the hotel. I don't know what it is, but... 
Oh god. No. Truly. What did I do next? Okay, it won't let me save here, so... I don't feel like replaying that conversation. I'm sure the man uses his funny super scythe if he gets too close. Kick. Tall. Man. Kick. Tall man. Kick. Tall man. What's 287 also? I don't even know. Okay. Thank you for kneeling down beside me, tall man. Kick, tall man. Boom. Oops. Good job, Trilby. You really... Good work. She's uninjured. She's fine. She would probably be safe on her bed while I continued my investigation. Do we just root through her things now? Guess not. Alright, later. Sorry I kicked you in the head. <laughs> Knocked you unconscious. Oh no! Please! Not like this. That's the best one, honestly. These little, these little mini hallucinations that it does sometimes. See, all of these games end up fitting together in the end. It just took a while for for him to figure out how the hell to do it. What am I doing next here? Hmm. Kick tall man. Oh. I thought it said there was nothing interesting in the backpack, just like textbooks. Well. Oh, well, I hope she's doing okay. Okay. Now we're comfortable looting her stuff. A few textbooks, a half-empty water bottle, and a large folder marked O'Malley Family History. Very convenient. 18th century, I read my discoveries out loud. Liverpool-based O'Malley Shipping Company, three generations. Though the loss of one of their clippers drove the company to bankruptcy. That must be the Sea Angel. The owner, Jacob O'Malley, placed the blame somewhat irrationally on a shipping crate which family legend alleged to be haunt the haunted crate, everybody. And there are numerous tales of bizarre events surrounding the crate, and the story of the crate's origin is no less mysterious. It goes that a strange young man came to a carpenter's at the living Liverpool dockyards with a very expensive looking harpsichord, which he insisted be smashed up in the wood used for whatever purpose the carpenter desired. Should've burned it. Should've burned it in a spaceship engine. He refused to leave until the instrument had been utterly broken into a, its component parts in front of his eyes and the wood sent to be made into crates for O'Malley shipping. When pressed for his name, the man identified himself as one Jack Freehorn. The Rooms of, Dra of Jack Freehorn, July 28th, 1778. So what trifle have you been wasting your father's money on now, Jack? What does it look like? Looks like a virginal. A harpsichord, actually, in the Flemish style. Quite old, quite expensive. Well, I suppose I should be grateful that something is distracting you from the occult for once. I fear you may be speaking too soon, my friend. Oh god, I should have known, you and your silly obsession. But what devilry inhabits, inhabits this magnificent instrument? The instrument as a whole is for the most part untainted by the ethereal realm. But its keys are what spark my interest. Unusually, they have been carved from centuries-old English oak. And that's the interesting part? 
I will not be disheartened by that sharp tongue of yours. The wood has gone through many incarnations before being incorporated into this device. Items of furniture, building material, in fact, just over 200 years ago, it was part of a wall. A wall of a certain inn on a well-traveled road in Wales. A unicorn? I'm so pleased you remember. I could hardly forget it, the way you've been obsessing quite heartily over it of late. Your correspondence persists in filling your head with rubbish about ghosts and demons. I count myself very lucky to have tracked down even a small piece of that history. Not history, holstery. I know I've already told you some of the wonderful stories attached to it. And this instrument has had its fair share of mysterious happenings. The usual batch of strange noises, sudden madness, and inexplicable deaths. Yep. This curiosity of yours for all things ungodly has no doubt already befouled your immortal soul. You are a fine fellow, Wilbur. You have not a drop of romance in your body. Now, stop browbeating me for my inquiring mind and let us take dinner. That night, Jack was stirred from his bed by the sound of music emanating from his new instrument. This is like the theme of this game, this song. His first thought was anger, mostly because the harpsichord was an antique never intended to be played. But then he listened to the haunting melancholy tune and felt his stomach roll inexplicably with fear. Who's down? Wilbur, is that you? Alright, you desire little for comfort. We got a bed, we got a desk. Well, a very low desk. Or could you need? Nothing too exciting. Well, it's an antique. Flintlock pistol. Hell yes. Get gun. Get gun. Now we'll teach that tall man a lesson. Look how silly he looks at that thing. Jack could not take a step further because he realized with a lurch that he recognized the dark figure that sat at the keys. He had read of the strange entity that recurred frequently in the stories surrounding the Unicorn Inn and the objects that were later constructed from its wood. And he knew with absolute certainty that the tall man would destroy him were he not destroyed first. Shoot, slender man. Worth a shot. Well, that's what we're doing. We're going backwards through the woods history, so we we solve the mystery in the end. Well, we will learn about this wood. Shoot, man. You won't take me, demon. Oops. Yeah, so I guess Trilby's kick was kind of lucky then, huh? Wilbur? No. Oh god, no, but I could have sworn. You. I know you. You have... have... Oh god. But please forgive me, your, your majesty, for my transgressions. I am a worthless craven fool, not worth a second of your precious time. I beg you, spare me. I will redeem myself for my offense. I will be yours forever, my body, mind, and soul. Alright. Thank you, my lord. Thank you. One Jack Freehorn. This may well be the same Jack Freehorn who went on to form a bizarre religious cult. A depraved group of paganist worshippers who are spoken with much derision by conventional society. With my latest flashback, my knowledge of the history of the Cursed Wood had gained another step. Yep, Cursed Wood. 
Before the crate, it had been a harpsichord. And sometime before the harpsichord, it had been part of some kind of... Cannot read that word right. Hostelry in Wales. An inn called the Unicorn. Why did that ring a bell somewhere in my recent memory? I'd definitely seen something in the Clan Bronwyn Hotel that was indeed linked to the place, but where? Slowly shuffle on down. Get that letter. Victim three. Freehorn. The third man who desired judgment was Freehorn, who had brought from those who made luxury who had bought from those who made luxuries with the wood that was the prince's soul. The prince came and struck down the lover of Freehorn, and Freehorn knew the name of the king. Also, those two were gay. And Freehorn said, I know you now, O prince, who was the arrogant man, and I anticipate your wish, and I will devote myself to spreading the teachings you have brought me and the love of our king. And the prince was satisfied, and Freehorn called all those who would listen, and they formed an order of blessed agonies that would work to redeem the follies of the men of technology. All right. Open the door. No. They'll show up a bit more, don't worry. Uh, I don't know that I need to be here. Be called lump of meat. I think we just go straight to the next, uh, oh, hang on. From somewhere to the west, I heard the familiar sound of a door being unlocked. Okay. Oh, Linkman. Linkman, wait. Finally, kitchen. What had once been a kitchen was now some kind of torture room. I found myself wondering whether it was used for extracting information or merely to entertain the alternate hotel's hellish proprietor. What happened to that body? Pain, I guess. It hurt. Oven is stained from the inside with desperate handprints. Can we go out here? Yeah, where this leads. Oh, okay. The old jammed emergency exit. I guess we'll have to start another fire. Can you head back here? The tiny cellar had been abandoned for some time. A large section of floor was worn away. The worn down area had been conquered by a swarm of greasy black beetles. Well. Whatever. This concludes the text of the notes found in Glam Brown Hotel on August 4th by an STP investigative team. At the time of writing, Trilby remains missing in action. We got beetled. They're hungry beetles. I really feel like you should throw that meat rather than setting it down gently, but... We're all just reading his notes. So if you die, it's just, well, somebody had to find these. What do we got over here? We got blood. Can't tell if there's like a body there. At least two individuals had met with sticky ends down here. One of them had been only almost completely picked clean by the beetles. The other, the other, I noticed, was heavily decayed except for its hand, which was fresh and pink. I wondered if this had something to do with the puddle of water it was laying in. Do we 
get the hand? Is this our second severed hand in the series? No? Okay. Probably won't carry around a severed hand. Only our buddy in the future will. Alright, it was almost as if the water was drawing me to it. Not like a scrabbling thing in my mind, like the chisel or the painting, but more like a beckoning siren. I couldn't help myself. I crouched down and dipped my hand in, and it felt uncommonly refreshing, and brought an amount up to my lips, my unhygienic surroundings forgotten. There is still a severed hand in this. I get that it's oddly fresh. As a pleasant feeling of simultaneous coolness and warmth spread from my stomach, I realized that the water had some sort of rejuvenating effect. I had no explanation for this, but at the time, I didn't care. As being to feel in the back of my mind the familiar tickling sensation that indicated a reality shift. So I swiftly scooped a few drops of the liquid into my pill bottle, shaking it through the remaining pills. This is great, smart, good work. Excellent job, Trilby. Boxes. Useless trinkets. We just look, look. All right, we got some old crates and a wine rack. Is it a good year? Good enough. What do you mean you won't take the wine? The stupid? Okay, making sure they don't. Anything? Drink the wine? Oh. oh. What the heck? I'm going to actually run a quick ad break, and I'll be back in a few minutes.
Okay, I'm back. Where to next? Actually, quick double check. Just yet. Ah, my old pal, the professor. Also, Siobhan is kind of missing now, which is not great. Also, Trilby is not... Yeah. I need you to understand. You and I and Siobhan are in critical danger. There's something evil in this hotel, and it's closing in fast. Mr. Railby, I have been over this hotel several times. Apart from us, there's absolutely nothing here. Please keep your fairy stories in the playroom where they belong. When did you last see her? I hope he's standing on the chair. Okay, so mentioned their meeting. Last scene in her room. An MIA. She's a willful girl, all right. No doubt she's gone on another one of her forest explorations. I see. All right, there's our unicorn down there. Well, it's on the floor, so, like, I want to look at it. This is fun. Need to do here, then. Oh, okay. We gotta get his permission, I guess. Oh, my cool shingle. That nobody wants. Don't suppose you have any clients who might go for it? Possibly. Can I examine it? Anyways, yeah. Don't break it over your leg. Now I'm allowed to touch it. Shingle's design was a simple one, of a unicorn's head and half profile, painted with average ability on a dark oak backing. As I pressed my fingertips to it, however, the design seemed to extrude from its backing like a hologram, and seemed to draw closer until my vision was filled with wood grain and mediocre brush strokes. Damn. Really calling out the art. I could vaguely detect the professor speaking to me, on the very edge of hearing, but by the time I realized it, I was already gone. Somewhere in Wales, July 28th, 1581. Owen Somerset, a traveling merchant, was on his way back to his wife and family in London, having concluded some business dealings in Cardigan. There it again. Caught suddenly by a summer storm, as one does, he spied an inn by the side of the road and marveled at his good fortune. Faith, tis an evil storm that blights the sky tonight. Aye. I must have the Almighty on my side to find some myself so close to an inn as it broke out. Aye, perhaps. The innkeeper seemed quite taciturn, but Owen was in a good mood and was determined for it not to leave him. It was probably too late to continue riding, even if the storm cleared. Owen decided to inquire after a room for the night. Ask innkeeper about room. Good evening, sir. Would it be possible to secure a bed for the night? Be a wiser man than I. Go from this place and never return. I... what? There is a curse upon this inn. I will not have an innocent doomed to the same fate as I. Okay. Nope. Sorry. We're... We're, we're seven minutes a skeptic. 
ask about the curse. <laughs> ask for a room. What do you want from me, game? I really, there's only one dude here. I really don't feel like I should have to address them. And plenty of gold? The devil cannot be bought off, my friend. What devil? What is the nature of this curse? This inn was built by my father 20 years ago. From the wood of a fallen oak, he stumbled upon an island north of here. He noticed human bones scattered around, but did not heed them. This inn has been a curse on our bloodline ever since. Madness and death claim those who stay here. This time last year, he claimed my father. Soon, I am certain, he shall claim me. That's cool. I want a room. So why do you remain? I do not believe in fleeing from the mistakes of the past. The Almighty wills that my family must pay for our errors. Then this I accept. But I would not see another suffer for our sins. Leave now before the shadows take you. No, it's cool. Sir, I have little patience for fables. And even less for riding after sundown in the middle of a downpour. Lend me a room and I shall take the responsibility for my own well-being. You will insist? Not only will I insist, but I will pay whatever price you ask. Go then, take the upstairs room. And if you remain by the morn, you shall pay nothing at all. Nice, free in room. Take him. Why not? Seems simple enough. Sleep. Owen lay himself down, intending only to test the bed's softness, but in his exhaustion, he quickly succumbed to sleep. In the early hours of the morning, something jolted Owen from his slumber. Piercing sound? No. Piercing smell. Alright, well, some smoke down there. Pretty chill about it. Place has been set before the front door. By whom? The innkeeper? Oh, I can't use my coat. Sorry, am I supposed to have water or something? Hmm, this is a conundrum. Oh, I got a little cape. Use cape on fire. Use coat on fire. Oh, once again, game. Ah, okay. I'm just being silly. I mean, I feel like in this situation, you would be okay with using your coat. Well, with, you know, being in a burning building and all. But I guess, you know, the sheet will do. Go downstairs for, like, the fourth time. God's name. Oh God, it's him, the innkeeper. Kind of. Who could have?
Once again, I return disoriented from my vision. I was closing in on the source of the madness. The innkeeper had said that the wood came from a tree on an island. Would that have been Clan Bronwyn Island? Given what I was seeing, it seemed a valid, if worrying, possibility. Besides that, it seemed I had no other leads. So what could I, what would I do? I was determined not to let the trail end there. If there were just a single clue. And well, the professor got tired, tired of us staring into space. And here's our next letter. Ah, okay, this isn't religious. Trilby, I know you are following a trail. Go to the roof if you wish to proceed. Oh, okay, here's our chick tract. Victim two, the innkeeper. The second man who desired judgment was the innkeeper, who had, brought the, who had bought the wood of the tree and built from it his house. The prince came to him and his guest, and he struck the innkeeper down, and the innkeeper knew the name of the king. And the prince turned to the innkeeper's guest, and he said, You I shall not let live, for once before have I made this warning, and still my soul aches with what is done to the wood that is my soul, and I will spare no man who injures me in this way. And the innkeeper's guest knew the name of the king. All right, to the roof. Well, what do we got here? Papers, a porcelain leg. Get leg, got it. Leggy. So before I climb like 10 trillion stairs, Okay, yeah, there's other stuff we can do. Is this the bar? I think this one's the bar. Yeah, there we go. Wait, what's the cursor? Okay, there is no cursor. Okay, about... Zoom on. Yeah, okay, she's still MIA. I don't care about her anymore. She can make her own choices. She wants to run away with any old smooth talker in a cheap suit. That's up to her. This man is making a horrible mistake thinking that women are attracted to Trilby. This head will be my new assistant. It will be a much better one. Sorry. What? Ask a bet about head. May I borrow that head, Professor? Oh, I see. You took one companion of mine away, and now you want another. I bet it's just a head. What could you possibly need it for? You don't understand. No one understands me. Go get me a drink, then we'll talk. Okay, fine. Well, I guess now we can get the wine. The take pill ruins my nice little open door shortcut. Get the wine. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. Now he's gone too, and he took his head with him. Do we need to go to the dark world?
Hmm. Drink the bar. Why is it saying drink cola? Can you drink the cola? Oh, right. The soda is the opposite of water. So it will take you to the dark world if you want to be in the dark world. But uh, you don't don't want to let your emotions get the better of you in this hotel. Or else this happens. Abe's drunken misery had caused him to shift into the dark hotel. The jolly man of whom I had grown fond lay decapitated on the floor. With Chauvin's disappearance, I was now truly alone. The professor had known nothing of the horror. He was blameless and ignorant of any manner involving Defoe Manor or a cursed idol. Really, it's not the idol. It's it's not that it's an idol at this point. You should have put that much together. You've been putting this together. But it seemed my dark captor cared little for these facts. Why haven't you killed me too, you skinny bastard? If you can do it so easily, so quickly, why won't you face me? In display of a warped sense of humor, the porcelain head was sitting where Abed's old one had been. Pulled the head out of the stump, trying not to think about the wet cracking noise this caused. Honestly, missed opportunity to have a wet cracking noise. This game's had some slimy sounds before. Alright, so we got... A leg and a head. But we still don't know why we need them. But that's just because I didn't try going to the roof yet. At the top of the roof is where we need all the body parts. <laughs> Wait, are we able to do this now? I mean, this door has been locked the entire time, but... Ten minutes. You're slipping. Here it is, the, the famous room we have yet to see. The pain room. Safe. It looks like some creature had exploded inside the safe and the blood had shot out through the cracks around the door. Very well, then. So we want to do this again, take a pill, light shift, so we can get into this wrong room, which I guess we can't pick the lock of in the light room? Light room, light world? Are we good at cracking safes still? I ain't had any cause to crack safes for some time, but my hands instantly went into automatic. The thieving mindset returned like an old friend. When the job was done, the safe opened, my nostalgia faded into puzzlement when I found it empty. Just for once, I'd like to crack a safe that actually contains something. Is that so much to ask? We got the desk. Not even a chair. Hotel maintenance, correspondence. Nothing. Do I have to shift into the dark world now? Oh, I'm sorry. We look on the shelf. There's a leg. Okay, so we got two legs, two legs and a head. We're getting there. Now, where else will we find some porcelain body parts? How about... Ah, well... The little hallucination scenes like this, though, are really good.
There's one. Why does that not work? Okay, we need to go to our hotel room next. Just eliminating all the all the wandering. The best of my ability. This is why I've never gone up these stairs yet. Three C or three B. Here we are. Somebody put an arm in my room. Okay. Two arms, a leg, and a head. I think the torso is up there. I'll risk it for the biscuit here and, and go upstairs. We don't have a ton more to go. I think I am just going to brute force my way to the end of this. Oh, well, okay. Great. Now I have to go down these stairs again, because I need to be in Hellworld. I had thought that I never showed the outside of not Hellworld, and that's because the door is locked in not Hellworld. I guess we drink soda. This happens every time I have caffeine, honestly. Bring her back. Well, let's just see what this says first. Mm -hmm. Put left arm on dummy. Oh, good. Don't have to do all this at once. We did it. We brought her back. Exodia, indeed. The body was intact. For reasons I couldn't explain, I sensed that something had changed back in the real world. What kind of ridiculous locking mechanism is this? And I really have to... I'm for a tranquilize. Oh, man. This guy's gonna have hallucinations when he's not in a haunted hotel. Now can I go outside? Yes. That looks nice, I guess. The view of the island was spectacular, but most of the roofs seemed to be sectioned off by a metal fence. We got a piece of paper! And Bronwyn Island, July 28th, AD, 1501. A sturdy tree, this. It took us from dawn to dusk, but we finally have it down. I'm tired, father. It was indeed clever of us to investigate this island, eh, boy? It's got trees. I have never seen such a gigantic oak, nor do I expect to again. But its wood shall keep us in the business of carpentry for years to come. Father, look at these stones. Do you think there was once a house here? It matters not. Why must you always look everywhere but at what ma what matters? This is your... Father? It, is something troubling you, Father? Uh-oh. Boyle could only watch, paralyzed as a demon tore into his father. Row. Let's chuck a rock at the tall man. Yeah. Hey. 
fish. What? Where am I? I must have shifted into the dark world during this vision. Yeah, it's very much the same Defoe dynamic. Oh, thank God. I thought I was all alone. What happened to you? I don't know. After you knocked me out of my room, I woke up and everything was like this. The hotel's ruins, there's blood everywhere. I saw this horrible man. Tall, thin, long black coat. You know him? Enough to know you're lucky to be alive. He didn't notice me, so I ran up here to hide. How'd you get past the doll? What doll? Trilby, what the hell is going on? I told you what would happen if you followed me into the shadows. This isn't your problem. Take these. What are these? Tranquilizer pills. Soaked in hand water. Take one. When you calm down, the hotel will go back to normal. Don't you need them? I don't need to run away anymore. Trilby, wait. Where are you going? I know enough now. I know where the wood came from. Perhaps I can find a way to end this. So I was right. The cursed wood came from Plain Brown Island. But what good does that knowledge give me? Wait a second. I never got around to reading that letter I took from under the rock. Trilby, I am very close to ending this. Meet me in the hotel basement. I must show you my discovery. Thank you. The other page was another one of those religious papers. The Book of Victims. Victim 1, the Woodcutter. The first of those against whom the prince sought vengeance was the Woodcutter. He who had held the axe that first felled the tree. The prince came to him and his son, and he struck the Woodcutter down, and the Woodcutter knew the name of the king. And the prince turned to the Woodcutter's son, and he said, Please don't throw rocks at me. You I shall let live. For you are young, and are of the innocents, and that you may go among your people and tell them of what I will wrought. And the woodcutter's son fled, and told all of what he had seen, but the men of technology are arrogant, and his words were unheeded. I'm glad for like, the end game, in, in true... In true Yahtzee fashion, we really need to take the longest walk imaginable. Man. Now I'm wishing my actual Refest game for ZZT was, like, in town mashed up with this sort of thing. Yeah, this place needs an elevator, honestly, almost as much as the space station did. Alright, well, to the basement then. Right. Use the cursor keys. Hmm. I know, I was kind of hoping that the speedy cola would let us just move faster. Ugh. I don't know if we need to be in Light World or Dark World for this. Well, I guess I got rid of my pills, so... Lockpicks, cola, and wine. We're ready for a good evening. Mm. Oh, can I go down here? Is that it? A tunnel? I'm down. What do you want me to call this? Oh. Enter hole. There we go. Hey, look. It's the tree. It was in some kind of cavern dug out of the rock beneath the hotel. It seemed to be in a constant state of flux, flitting back and forth between the real world and its dark twin. I was certain that the gigantic stump in the middle of the floor had something to do with this. We've got it. We found the cursed wood. Okay, what do I do? Where's Linkman? 
Oh, right, of course. Same thing we've done this entire game. Touch that wood. And Bronwyn Peninsula, July 28th, 55 BC. Cabadath, a Celtic druid, awaits the return of his friend and colleague Galton, who brings the news of the invasion of Anglesey by the Roman guy. <laughs> Having fallen out of favor with his fellows for certain radical beliefs and activities, Cabadath lives in solitude in this remote forest clearing and prefers not to travel himself. Cabadath? Alden, you bring news? The foreigners have landed. They could not be deter deterred by our sorcery. All is lost. Oh? Certain, are you? But they are making their way across this land, eliminating resistance. Even you, out here, will be brought down within days. I'm sorry, Cabadath. And the great druids of Anglesey bow so easily to this brash foreign power? Do not hang your head yet, my friend. Perhaps the activities for which I was ostracized could yet spell an answer. What are you talking about? You know of my dealings with the ethereal realm. I know what you claim. That there exists some otherworldly territory populated by demons and creatures of magic. With a K. That's how you know it's the good stuff. And that you, Cabadath, can somehow commune with these creatures. Come inside and I shall explain. Cabadath, what is this madness? In my dealings with the ethereal realm, I have learned of many powerful demons and elementals. But there is only one, one spoken of only reluctantly, a beast possessing an awesome power. You plan to summon a demon? The most terrible of them all, who strikes fear into even the most unflappable creatures I have spoken with. A pain elemental, indeed the only pain elemental, ruler of a desolate wasteland where none venture. An invulnerable, hugely potent beast that feeds on the agony of others. And today is his day. The day when the boundaries between the realms weaken and he glimpses our world. To bring him through at that point should be simple. Even if you could conjure such a thing. How would you have it defend our land? I have much knowledge in the ways of magic. With the correct bindings, any demon can be forced to my will. I completed the preparations while I waited for your return. All that remains is the summoning. Cabadath, it pains me to see you build your hopes on such nonsense. Be silent and watch. You shall see your nonsense soon enough. This hall of death, and by the light of Elena's gift, I summon you. I bring you gifts to mark your path. I feed you with pain. I call you with madness. I summon you with the greatest loss. And I bind you by your true name. Chazo. The gods. I have reached out to you through the void, Chazo. I command you by your true name. Show yourself. Kavadath, please stop this. Show yourself. By two ladies. It's huge. It it is larger than I anticipated. But Chizo must obey the rules of magic. It is bound. I can command it. Eh no. It is far more powerful than I thought. Alden, help me. Uh see ya. No! Carlton, I beg you. Don't let it take me alive. Chizo, of course, has no use for meat. It feeds on pain. It does not kill its prisoners. Cavadas' agony was a particularly rare morsel, and Chizo ensured it would last. 
His soul was placed inside an oak sapling on the site of his old home to grant his body immortality. For five centuries, as the tree grew, he knew torment beyond even his most depraved imaginings. By then, his body was warped, and his mind long fallen into soulless dementia. He was Chizos, utterly and completely his slave. Trilby. Chauvin? You were supposed to leave. I couldn't, I just... Abed, the professor, he's dead. I know. I probably should have told you this. Anyways, they will kill you if you don't get away from here. What is this place? This cave is the center of the reality shift. This stump is what's causing it all. Ow. It is the vessel for the soul of the tall man. The Acolyte of Chizou. Lankman? Nice to see a friendly face. Amazing, isn't it? Of all the things Sir Roderick could have used to murder his son, he chose that idol. Placing the soul of John the Foe into the wood alongside Cabadath's. Infusing him with Chizou's magic, allowing him to come back more powerful than before. Certainly pretty lucky. Lucky? Chizou had to wait 2,000 years for that opportunity. The opportunity to blend magic and science in a single entity. The opportunity to create the bridge. What are you talking about? The bridge between the realms. Over which Shizou will cross into our universe and purify mankind. Our order has waited 200 years for the prophecy to be fulfilled. You're not with the Ministry of Occultism? <laughs> Who are you? 200 years ago, the prophet Jack Freehorn founded the Order of Blessed Agonies. Since then, we have grown and watched and waited. It was only in recent years that the events foretold in the Book of Chizou began to occur. It mentioned John Defoe. And it mentioned you. Me? You were the one prophesied to guide the bridgekeeper to his destiny. But you didn't finish the job. All three aspects of John Defoe had to be destroyed to create the bridge. Body, mind, and soul. You only destroyed his body. His soul and mind remained. Had I known about this, I wouldn't have even done that. That will truly disappoint my superiors. They were quite adamant that I should try to persuade you to join our cause and fulfill your foretold duty. Is that why you were helping me? They thought if I guided you through your visions and showed you the appropriate passages from our holy books, you'd understand that the prophecy is real. You honestly believed I'd join some insane cult just because you handed me some leaflets. Personally, no. A knife in my gut brought an explosion of ice-cold agony. I heard the pitter-patter of my blood on the rocky floor. The pain, the surprise, and my exhaustion went together to cause immediate unconsciousness. Not beans. Not beans. I awoke to find myself splayed upon the stump, blood slowly, still slowly leaking from my wound. In my injured state, I could barely move. My limbs refused to respond. I was as weak as a newborn. Bankman? Oh gosh, you're awake. I was afraid you'd miss this. What are you doing? After your staggering ineptitude in Defoe Manor, the Order needed to nudge things along. We need a connection to Joe, Chizo, to help administrate his coming. And today might be the only opportunity we have all year to summon the tall man. You're going to bring that thing into our world? With a standard ritual of blessed agonies and an offering. After he takes your life, he will be grateful to us. And then he will guide us to our destiny. So why did you stab me? What if I'm already dead by the time he gets here? You won't be. Men like you, Trilby, die on their own terms. If they don't weakly let their life slip away from one measly like knife wound. Hush now. Cavadath is coming.
Oh, yep, yeah, we're getting called. So there's a ritual going on, and we gotta find a way to do things, but also it hurts. My position, I could only see a small portion of the Wavering Cavern. I could see the idol of John Defoe on the stump beside me, and my bloody waistcoat lying discarded in the corner. So the fun thing about this game, though, not having been planned until after seven days, is that it means that Trilby's note in the box for seven days, like, mentions none of this whatsoever, which is really funny. Alright, so... Things suck. What do we do? We look at the trinket. The idol? They call it a trinket many a time. It's not. Call thee from the east. Yes. Why are you summoning the tall man? What possible use could he be to you? You've been experiencing flashbacks, I know. You saw Kavadat's attempt to summon Shizo, yes? saw that he failed quite drastically. He assumed our lord could be summoned with any old basic demon summoning right. But Chizou is far greater and more powerful than his rivals. He is very nearly a god, a god of pain. It takes a great amount of magic and a much more complex ritual to summon one such as he. We do not know it, but the tall man does. He will guide us and teach us. What other talking can we do? We can't really do much more than talk. What happens if I say move? Nope. Nothing good. Nothing good happens if we move. Alright, we can try and talk to Shoban. She's here, but she can't answer me. She has nothing to do with this link. Let her go. On the contrary. It is important that all three of us be here. It is part of the ritual. You know, to have three people. What else can we talk about? What does the prophecy say about me? Mm -hmm. His body, mind, and soul are destroyed in conjunction. The bridge between the realms will be created. It also states that you are supposed to guide this process. But we can expect one or two inaccuracies in a prophecy written so long ago. Call thee from the west. losing blood steadily. My arms and legs were limp and unresponsive. I couldn't move. Alright, that's the same thing. Oh, right, he's, he's getting here. Oh, well, I missed something there. Reality flits from realm to realm, tormented, confused, and this madness that we might bring thee to us. to her. All oh, man is Kavadath, right? I'm glad to see you were paying attention. Hey, I put two and two together. End it, Kavadath. This stump, it's causing the reality shift. It's partly that. Partly it's today's date, too. It's so special about it. July 28th is the day when the border between the ethereal realm and the scientific realm weaken. It's the day when Shizou takes his yearly gaze upon our world. And the day when the tall man is given leave to exact vengeance on those who torment the wood that is his soul. 
was becoming harder and harder to breathe. Air rattled in and out of my lungs like a buzz saw. I present thee with blessed agonies. Body, mind, and soul. I was, oh, well, okay, we're, we're pretty dead now. So this is the final puzzle. We can't really do much, we can't even speak anymore. But I do love what you're supposed to do here. Oh, not yet. That's the, that's the problem, is that you don't know when it lets you do it. And now I just kind of spoiled it. But we do just tell ourselves to die, because as Lankman said, we die on our own terms. And it will ruin the ritual. There we go. My vision was clouding up around the edges. It seemed like my stubborn will was the only thing keeping me alive. Well, none of that, then. I died. Yeah, the window is kind of narrow, unfortunately. What? He's dead? No, that's not possible. Master? Master, please, no. And then something happens. See? He's got sound effects. He's got a sound library that works for what he's doing. Trilby? Go back, Trilby. Leave me alone. I'm dead. Not yet. Not fully. Your mind and soul are drifting apart from your body. With enough power, there is still time to pull them back. But you must have the will to return. Forget it. I've had enough. I did the assignments, I made myself useful, I lived up to the reputation the foe manor gave me. Today, I gave everything I could. And I still died. There is still work to be done. You have not yet completed your duty. Sick of duty, I'm sick of prophecy. Just let me sleep. Stronger men than you have tried to fight destiny. None succeeded. Past, present, and future are all different faces of the same die, and a few can see them all at once. But I can, and the future demands that you live. Return now. I have marked the path. Please just let it end. Pleading to me is useless. I am just as much a prisoner of fate as you. The future your actions are destined to bring about has already taken place. Without your part, I would not be here to restore you to life. So you see, by my mere presence, your decision is already made. Who are you? A murderer, and a madman, and a puppet of forces neither of us could possibly comprehend. He's okay. What? You're alive. Oh god, I didn't even know if I was doing it properly. But I did it. You're alive. Where's Lankman? That tall man took him. He did something horrible to him. And then he took him away. Where's my waistcoat? Shh, don't talk. I've already called for an ambulance. Let's get you back upstairs. Wait. See that wooden idol? Yes. Bring it with us. Wrap it tightly in clothes and bring it with us. Don't let it touch your bare skin. Oh, okay. And now it sits across from me. The reality shift had cleared up and we were free to leave. An STP cleanup crew arrived with the ambulance. No trace of Abed or the hotel staff was found. Officially, they've been classified as unexplained disappearances.
Linkman and the Tall Man seem to have also vanished, which does not surprise me in the least. Chauvin signed the official Secrets Act, and last I heard is staying with her parents to recuperate. Which just leaves me to write up my notes, with the idol that haunts my dreams gazing at me from across my desk. I was dead. I can't pretend I wasn't. No amount of CPR could have brought me back from where I was. So who did? The man in red? Who was he if not an insane hallucination and brain death? Unimportant. I am alive, and that's all that matters. Just that, and the destiny of this wretched statuette that I am apparently fated to carry out. Every instinct in my being wants to burn it to ashes and grind them into the dirt, but I do not. Linkman spoke of a prophecy, that the destruction of John Defoe's soul would somehow help him in his order summon their dark god. So if I can't destroy the idol, if I destroy the idol, they win. But what else can I do? I certainly can't keep it. I know from experience that leaks malevolent influence like a broken pipe leaks water. The only other option is to hide it. But where can I hide such a thing and ensure that it is never found again by human hands? I shall have to think about this. The fulfillment of the prophecy continues. The ritual for the summoning of Shizou will go ahead. Events have been set in motion that cannot be stopped. We have the blood of the guide. Now we must wait. Wait and prepare. At this time there came a man from the land of technology, and though his wisdom was great and his power advanced, he had the willfulness of his fellows, and so he was the arrogant man. And on the eight and twentieth day of the seventh month of the year of the arrogant man, the king gazed upon the land of technology and saw the arrogant man who spake thus. O king, I beseech you, for this land has become corrupt without your benevolent hand, and darkness seeks to envelope us all. I demand of you to cross the border between our lands and make things right, for my power is great, and I have it in my power to control one even as great as you. And the king was rightly amused, for while the arrogant man's power was indeed great, the king's power was greater still, and the king said, I will not submit myself, for firstly my power is greater than yours, and not yours to command. Secondly, while my capabilities are many, it is impossible for me to enter the land of technology, for the border is a dark and treacherous ocean I cannot will away. But I will do this for you, O arrogant man. For all the bigness of your head, you are still small enough to be spared the rigors of the dark ocean. I shall rescue you from the darkness in the land of technology, and you shall live in my household, and here you will learn humility. And as the king said it, so it was so, and the arrogant man crossed the ocean to the house of the king, where he was brought before his majesty, who said, Now you must repay me for the slight of your arrogance caused for the slight your arrogance caused me. For despite your insult, I love you as I love every man and beast, and you must learn to take this love into your heart. And the king took the body and mind of the arrogant man and separated them from his soul. And this he placed in a great tree in the land of technology, and with this action he announced, Now you are the tree, and the tree is you, and the wood is your soul. With this gift of separation, your body shall not wither or die throughout your lessons. But should any man interfere with the tree that is your soul on the day that is mine, I shall lend you the power to confront them and strike them down with fitting vengeance. And then he touched the arrogant man and filled his heart with his warming love, and the arrogant man became the prince, and he knew the name of the king. And the prince and the court of the king bowed down and wept and sang with great praise the name of the king, for great and generous was his wisdom. The Books of Chizou Book of the Prince, Chapter 2. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of fan art 
there's a lot of people who are who who are in very much into Cabadath, the tall man, and and Trilby to varying degrees. And as for his weird weapon, I don't know. It's like a multi scythe, but like more often than not, he stabs people with just the blunt end. It's very silly. But shout out to this guy, Mark Lovegrove, Lovegrove, for finally getting us away from RPG Maker music. I do like this game's soundtrack. Web hosting. Thank you for the sub annihilation. I appreciate that. Thanks to everyone who demanded another truly game. Oh man, my, my voice is shot. I read too much. Holy Ramblomatic Production. Website's still up. A lot of the download links seem to be broken, though. Like, I actually got these copies from an old... Like, I had to get these off an old computer that I still had them on, thankfully. I think one of them worked. I think, like, the full collection link worked, but all the individual ones. I don't actually know if people can play the non-special editions these days, which aren't super different, but, like should still be around somewhere, I hope. They're probably on archive.org. I didn't actually look, because I have this. But that's Trilby's Notes, and it's the, it's the best one, like, straight up. He said that he wanted to release a game that people would still be able to discuss afterwards, and he did. It got people, like, super invested. And I know when I played this one, I also, like, could not wait to figure out how this was going to wrap up. And that's pretty much what the fourth game does. It manages to tie every one of these together, and it still does a pretty solid job. It's just, uh... Not as good. Like, I don't think it's... It's not as creepy. It's... It's ending is great. I do like the ending. I do like some of the stuff towards the end of it, but... This one is definitely the high note for the series, aside from, you know, a few parser issues here and there. But as far as retconning goes, this, this man is going to make seven days and five days properly connect. All will be explained next week, at noon Pacific. I'll play the final game in the series, Six Days of Sacrifice. Which also has an absolutely buck wild scene that I don't even know <laughs> how I'm gonna present, but. But thank you all for watching. I hope you all enjoyed yourselves. Uh, if you enjoyed the stream, I do. ZZT streaming is what I'm normally doing here. I think I got my first subscriber, or somebody's gonna be like, oh boy, classic adventure games. Well, tough luck. Two, well, okay, Marvel's lost you. You count on the ZZT side, but thank you for that. But I will be streaming again Friday. No, actually, I'm not streaming this Friday. I'm actually taking that night off because I've got things to do. Uh, it sure does. My next stream is going to be Sunday, but that's going to be me being a guest on a different channel. Yeah. Still still started typing Worlds of ZZT when I started typing the channel name. We're going to be on myself, Zinfandel, and Cyborg Girl here are going to be on Zinfandel ZT's channel playing some shareware off the Game Empire shareware CD. And then next Wednesday at noon, I'm going to be wrapping this series up, I hope. But thank you all for watching. Thank you for the support. And hope you see you next time. Later. <laughs>